rejoice to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I believe that that is true. I believe that it was good that you came to church on Labor Day weekend. I believe that it was good that you took some time out of your busy schedule to come and get a good word from God. Do you believe that? Yeah. Yes. I believe that with all my heart. But before we kind of, you know, get into tonight, I want to take a second to introduce myself because I'm probably not the person that you assume is going to be on the stage today. Uh, Pastor Eric uh, and Pastor Kelly are actually preaching for Pastor Anthony Milas over in New Hampshire. So you guys are stuck with me, Pastor Braddon, uh, his son tonight. Yes, everybody say yay! Yay! They are out of town preaching for Pastor Anthony, so you guys are stuck with me, uh, and it's going to be fun. I'm, if you didn't get the chance to, to hear it earlier, uh, I am our junior high student pastor, so I get to hang out with students every single Wednesday night, and we try not to burn the building down, and we're mostly successful, um, most of the time, 90, 85% of the time. It's a good time. But yeah, uh, today, tonight is going to be a really good time, you guys. We're going to continue our study through the, past, uh, the, the chapter, goodness, so many different words. We're going to get the book. Thank you, Susie. We're going to continue our study through the book of John. Everybody say the book of John. The book of John is what we've been talking through this entire summer. We've gone through 20 chapters because today we're talking about the 20th chapter. Everybody say John 20. So to this point, we've talked through the Last Supper in John 13. We've talked through the Garden of Gethsemane. We've talked through uh, the betrayal of Jesus. We talked through the trial of Jesus. And then last week, Pastor Eric talked us through the crucifixion of Jesus. But he left me the best part. Like, without a doubt, I got the most bestest message that I could have possibly asked for because we're talking about the empty tomb tonight. Make some noise if you are glad that that tomb is empty. Yes. That is some good news. Uh, we're going to basically just going to read through John 20. I'm going to read through a section, and then I'm going to talk about what we can learn from that section, and we'll kind of bounce back and forth. I've got like six points, but they're really fast, okay? So, I, guys, like, I talk really fast, just like my dad does, but I'm also way less profound, so I just talk way faster with less things to say. So it's going to be fast today, trust me. Trust me. <laughs> Not to, I thought you said it's true. I was like, Thanks. So today's going to be awesome. Uh, my plan is just to kind of pray and launch into it, but you guys, have, you guys have to promise me something. I need you to preach with me tonight, okay? If we don't do this together, this is no fun for either of us, okay? Because you get out what you put in, and I need your help. Are you guys going to help me preach tonight? Okay. I appreciate you, Preston. You're the man. All right. Let me pray. Let me pray, and we're going to talk through John 20. This is going to be great. So Jesus, thank you so much that you are here. Thank you so much that we can feel your power and your presence. Uh, God, I ask that you would just speak through me today. Uh, help me not say anything dumb. I pray that you would say all the things that you want to say through me. Uh, help me say things that aren't even on my notes, just for the people in this room who need to hear it. Um, God, I ask that you help everybody find the one thing that was for them. I, I just, in Jesus' name, I just command distractions and lies of the enemy to be bound and banished in the name of Jesus Christ. Let nothing be heard except your word. In Jesus' name, we all said... Amen. All right, so here's what I need you guys to do. I need you to turn to the person next to you and tell them the single coolest thing that you ever got to witness in person and tell them what it was. So look at the person next to you. Tell them, like, the coolest thing that you ever got to witness in person. Ready? Go. You guys promised you'd help me. You got to talk. All right, so coolest thing you ever heard in person. I, I was kind of listening to you guys. I could hear some like really awesome things like, like the birth of your children or like when, when you, got, to, when you got, like, got married, like the coolest thing you ever got to be a part of. I want you guys to know what I'm about to tell you blows all of that out of the water, hands down, okay? So this happened just a couple weeks ago. Okay, I'm a big nerd and I like to disc golf, okay? It's super, super fun. Uh, if you don't know what disc golf is, it's like regular golf. You just throw Frisbees into a basket instead of balls into a hole, okay, right? So it's, it's super fun, really nerdy, but it's, it's a really good time. It's like my main hobby. So me and some friends were down in Iowa because we were at our family farm, and we were playing Frisbee golf at my favorite course. It's in Mason City. It's called East Park. Beautiful course. Uh, it's free, which is really awesome. Super well-maintained, big fan. So it was me and my buddy Carter, and he had never played there before. So at every single hole, 
And I was kind of giving him kind of like the, the layout of like how he should make his shot because he doesn't really know where the baskets are. He doesn't know which trees to miss. So I'm trying to help him pick the right discs and make the right throw, right? So we get to, I think it was hole 13, okay? All right, and I'm like, all right, so Carter, this hole, the fairway is a lie, okay? It's a big S. Don't try to shape your shot like the fairway. The best thing that you can do is you can just throw something straight that flips up to flat, starts to finish left, and then fights through the trees and hope you get through. So that's what I told him. And I was like, so the, the idea is it should look kind of something like this, <laughs> like I was going to make the right shot. But I actually did. So I, I line up, and I, I, I do my follow through, and I, I, I throw my shot, and we got to watch it as it went straight, flipped up to flat, started to fade back left, fought through the trees, and landed right in the basket. You guys, I had done it. I had thrown my very first ace. So the coolest thing ever is that you can hear it uh, when it hits, because it hits these chains, right? It's like the most satisfying like ching, ching noise you've ever heard. So we're watching it go, and then we see it fade, and it lands in there, and there was like two whole seconds where I was like, and then I went, oh my gosh! Ah! Ah! And I just started running in circles, and Carter was like, what did I just see? Because we just saw me throw a disc over 300 feet right into the basket. It was one of my favorite moments of all time. I know that the birth of your children was awesome, but it was not as cool <laughs> as getting a hole in one. So that was probably one of the coolest things that I ever got to be a part of, but today we're going to talk about the coolest thing that I think anybody could have ever witnessed, which is what the disciples got to witness, which was seeing the empty tomb. It was even cooler than getting a hole-in-one in disc golf. So, like I said, we're going to read through John 20. We'll kind of stop after each section, and I'll talk about what I think we can learn from it. Can we do that? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. I'm all, all of breath because I just ran in circles. Gosh. Okay, so let's, this is how John's 20 starts. Let's read this together. John 21 through 8 says, Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. Talking about John. She said, They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Guys, John is writing this, and he's saying, BT dubs, I beat Peter in a race. No big deal or nothing. <laughs> I guess if you're going to write a book of the Bible, you might as well, you know, include the things you want. He stooped and looked in, uh, he stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings laying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings, li uh, the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered, covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw, and what is that last word? He saw and believed. Believed. Everybody say number one. number one. Here's the first thing I think we can learn from this passage. Number one. When John saw the empty tomb, he just knew that Jesus was alive. This is why John wrote the book of John, that he wants you to believe like he believed. John wants you to believe that the tomb was empty. Guys, I want you to think about this for a second. Would this book have really been worth writing if Jesus had just stayed dead? Would, this, would, would Jesus have really been any different than any other kind of cool guy, he, like he showed up and did some miracles or whatever, and just stayed dead? Would this book have really been worth writing if he hadn't actually gotten back up? No, because then Jesus would have been like everybody else if he had just been like a regular dude who did some cool things and then died. It doesn't make him different than really anybody. But, <laughs> if he beats the grave, if he defeats Death, that changes everything. That changes absolutely everything. That goes, that takes Jesus from being just some regular guy to being actually who he said he was. The actual son of God who died for your sins and defeated sin, sickness, and death. That is someone who is worth putting your trust in and that changes absolutely everything. The important part that John is trying to get us to understand is that he didn't just stay dead, he actually got up, and that is the most important thing that we could possibly get from this book. This is John 20, 30, uh, 20, 31. It says, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, 
the Son of God, and that in believing in him, you may have life in his name. The idea is that we would have life because of what Jesus did. The idea is that John wants us to have a life that walks hand in hand with Christ because he can give us something so much greater than we could ever do by ourselves. And the reason why that's the case is because he got back up. So what does, look, uh, what does, what does a life with Christ actually look like? So what, what does, what, what does, what, what, how does that make us actually different? If we actually follow Christ, how does that make our lives any different than anybody else's? And the cool part is that the rest of John 20 is basically an answer to that question. So the next couple points are just talking about how our lives as Christians are different than the rest of the world. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's keep reading. We're gonna skip down to verse 19 if you're following in your Bible. So it says, that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Suddenly, Jesus was standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. As he spoke, he showed them the wounds on his hands and his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again, he said, peace be with you. We're going to stop right there. Number two, everybody say number two. The second thing I think we can learn from this passage is when we believe Jesus is alive, we are given supernatural peace. Everybody say peace. When we believe that Jesus is alive, we are given supernatural peace. Authors tend to repeat what's important, and I think it's interesting that John includes that Jesus two different times in the same kind of span of a couple seconds says, hey, chill out. Peace be with you. See, when we follow God as Christians, we get peace that the rest of the world does not have. When we decide to follow our risen Savior, because he got back up, when we decide to follow him, we get peace that the rest of the world does not get. While the rest of the world is freaking, about, freaking out about who's in the White House, they're freaking out about all the things that are happening all over the world, they're freaking, about their, uh, freaking out about their to-do list, about their job, about how they're going to put food on the table, while the rest of the world is freaking out about that stuff, we get supernatural peace. Everybody go, <sighs> we get supernatural peace in Jesus' name. Now, the question is, why? Why do we get supernatural peace in Jesus' name? Because if we worship a God that beat death, that beat death, I think he can probably make sure that I get the things on my to-do list done. Right? We, if, we, if, we, if we have peace because we follow a God that actually beat everything else we could possibly come up against, and that's why we get supernatural peace. It's because of Jesus, which is pretty stinking awesome. A couple verses about this that I love. This is John 14, 27. It says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let, your hearts be, uh, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Don't be afraid. You've got nothing to worry about. The God of the universe who defeated death is in your corner and cares about you. you got nothing to worry about. This is John 16, 33. It says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. There's that word again. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. If you are glad that God has overcome the world, please make some noise tonight. That is so good. God has overcome the world. We get supernatural peace when we do a life with Christ. I wrote down a couple different ways about how God was kind of giving peace to the disciples in that moment, and I think these are the same ways that we get peace in our life. So first of all, we get peace between us and Jesus. He's standing there among the, uh, he's standing there among the disciples, offering them himself as a friend and a helper, not as a judge. We get peace between us and God, obviously because Jesus forgave our sins. We get peace between us and others who are in Christ. We get peace in our own souls. The fact that we no longer have to live with a guilty conscience because we know that our sin is paid for in Jesus' name. And we get the hope of peace for our whole world because we know that one day, hopefully soon, Jesus is gonna come back and make this world not broken anymore and he's gonna make it good. That gives us peace in our circumstances of everything that we can come up against. Guys, when we, when we follow Jesus, we get supernatural peace. Everybody go. God's got it. 
He's got it. He defeated the grave. He can help you get through anything that you could possibly come up against. Let's go back to the passage. Let's keep reading. It says, as he spoke to them, he showed them the wounds on his hands and on the side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. Again, he said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, what's that last section? So I am sending you. Number three, everybody say number three. three. When we believe Jesus is alive, we are given supernatural mission. When we believe that Jesus is alive, we are given supernatural mission. Everyone say, I am sent. I am sent. After Christ raised from the dead, he came to the disciples. He was like, guys, I know that you saw me do all this cool stuff. You saw me like, you know, feed 5,000 people with like a filet of fish. That was rad. You got to see me like uh, give sight to the blind, which was awesome. You got to see me raised from the dead, which was like the ultimate awesome thing. But you have to go and tell someone. You have to, this can't, this super awesome thing that will never ever be done again, you have to make sure that the world hears about it because this matters. What the knowledge that we have, that the disciples had, is the knowledge that will help someone get through their life. It's the, it's the knowledge that is the difference between an eternity with Jesus and an eternity apart from Jesus. Guys, this is our job. Everybody say, this is my job. It is our job to tell the world about the fact that Jesus really did rise from the dead. That's a real thing that happened. He really did pay for people's sins and die on a cross and rise again for us. That is our job to tell the world. That's why our mission statement as a church is this. I'm going to put it up on the screen so we can say it together. Ready? One, two, three. We exist to help as many people as we can cross the line of faith and follow Jesus. That is the only reason why we exist as a church. Because we understand the fact that people are on a trajectory of one of two places. They're either going to heaven or they're going to hell. And it's our job as Christians to make sure that we can help as many people as we can cross the line of faith and follow Jesus so that they go to heaven when they die. And also so they get life in this life. That is our job. Everybody say, this is my job. The cool thing is that we have a really, really awesome opportunity to actually live this out in the next week or so. Fall kickoff is right around the corner. It's September 18th and 19th, and our, our, uh, our mission for the whole church is that each person would just bring one person. Not that you would invite someone and hope for the best, but that you would actually make sure that you didn't sit in the seats by yourself on September 18th and 19th. What if you were able to bring someone? What if you brought someone to that service and they actually got an idea of God's grace and goodness in their lives? They could see their lives go someplace amazing and you would get to be a part of it. What if you brought someone on September 18th and 19th? I actually want to, to take a second and actually be the mission for a minute. I want you to take, take out a pen. If you're, if you're taking notes, it's great. If you want to take, a, take notes on your phone, that's fine. But actually write down a name of someone that you can bring. I actually want you to do this. Write down a name of somebody who you can bring September 18th and 19th. I'll give you a second. I forgot to bring a pen, but I do have someone that I wrote down earlier, just so you guys know. Guys, I had you do that because this matters. This is the reason why we are on earth. This is the reason why we exist as a church, is to help as many people as we can cross the line of faith and follow Jesus. Why? Because eternities are in the balance. You could save someone's life this September. Yes, still alive? All right, Susie's alive. That's good. All right, let's go back to the passage. All right, let's go back to the passage. We're just going to keep trucking along. We'll read a section, talk about a section. So this is after Jesus says that, uh, that they are sent. So John 20, 22 through 23, it says, Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If, anyone forgives, uh, if, if you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. Number four, everybody say number four. When we believe Jesus is alive, we are given supernatural power. Everybody say power. Let's be honest, by raise of hands, sometimes doing what God tells us to do is a little scary. Raise your hand if you've ever been scared to do what God told you to do. Yes, if you're not raising your hand, you're probably lying. Because doing what God tells us to do sometimes can be really scary. I know I'm speaking from personal experiences. There's been times when God has asked me to do something, and I'm like, dude, are you crazy? 
Like, that sounds, that sounds really hard and super awkward to talk about my faith with that random dude I have never met. But here's the thing. We don't need to be afraid because God gives us the power to be able to, to do everything that he's called us to. The good news is that God gives us supernatural power to accomplish everything that he's called us to do. He's never going to call you to something that he doesn't perfectly equip you for. And the way that he does that is with the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, if you follow God, if you've made Jesus the leader and forgiver of your life and you've decided to follow him, that means the Holy Spirit lives in us. That means that the power of God himself lives within us, which means that we have the power to do anything that he calls us to do. This is Acts 1.8. It says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Guys, we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear because we have the power of the Holy Spirit in us. The Bible's pretty clear. It says the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that lives within you and me. And if that's the case, then there is nothing that we have to be afraid of. When God calls us to do something, even though it's hard, we are perfectly equipped for the mission that he has called before us. Guys, there's been so many times when I've been so nervous to share my faith with someone. I've been been like, dude, I'm sweaty. This is going to be awkward. I felt like I said something weird, and I stuttered like 400,000 times. There's been so many times when that's happened, but I've always just kind of like done my best to suck it up and just do it anyway. And the best part, the best part is that 100% of the time, it pays off. Because I get to see these people who I brought to church or who I shared my faith with, I get to see them raise their hand in service to accept Christ. Or at the very least, maybe they were able to just take one more step on their faith journey and it sparked a great conversation that we could have about faith after service or at the restaurant while we were talking. Guys, it is so worth it to be able to be a part of the life change that we get to see here and it's our job to do it. But we got nothing to be afraid of. The same power that raised Christ from the dead lives within you and within me. And that's pretty stinking awesome. Everybody say, God's power is in me. me. We can do this. A couple more things. All right, let's go back to the passage. This is so good. I love this passage so much. All right, John 20, 24 through 25. It says, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, talking to Thomas, we have seen the Lord. Number five, everybody say number five. When we believe Jesus is alive, we, uh, when we believe that Jesus is alive, we have a supernatural story. When we believe that Jesus is alive, we have a supernatural story. A lot of people ask me all the time, they're like, hey, how do I, how do I actually go about, like, sharing my faith? Like, how do I make sure I don't say something dumb? How do I make sure I don't say something that can be, like, easily refuted? How How can I tell them something that they just can't argue with? And the answer is you just share your story. Guys, nobody can argue with your story. Nobody can argue with the fact that before God you were one way, but after God you were another way. No one can argue with the addictions broken, with the marriages healed, the friendships healed. Nobody can argue with any of that. And that's how we're supposed to share our faith. We're just supposed to say, hey, dude, like this is what God did in my life. And he could do the same thing in yours if you would let him. It made me think of John 9, John 9, when Jesus heals the blind man. The Pharisees are like, they're hanging out with the blind dude, and they're like, dude, how come you're not blind anymore? Like, this Jesus guy seems really weird. How can we know he's even legit? And the blind guy's like, I don't know what to tell you. I was blind, then I saw Jesus, and now I'm not. I don't know what to tell you. That's how we're supposed to share our faith, that once I was blind, but now I see. Once my life was this way, but now it's fixed. Once I was broken, but now I'm put back together. That's how we're supposed to share our faith. No one can argue with your story. Everybody say, no one can argue with my story. I once was blind, but now I see and no one can argue with that. All right, last section. Last section, then we'll be done. This is John 20, 24 through 28. This is the best part of the whole verse, hands down. It says, one of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, we have seen the Lord. 
But he replied, I won't believe, I won't believe it until, or unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, just as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you. Again, there's that thing. Peace be with you. Chill out. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound on my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And Thomas exclaimed, my Lord and my God. Last point, everybody say number six. Number six, when we believe that Jesus is alive, we have ringside seats to supernatural life change. When we believe that Jesus is alive, we have, super, we have ringside seats to supernatural life change. Guys, the disciples got to see one of their friends, basically a family member. They've been doing life for a long time together. They got to see someone that they cared about deeply go from doubting Christ and saying, no, this is this, this not real. There's no way he got back up. I won't believe it until I see it. And they got to share their story with him, and they got to watch as Jesus showed up in Thomas's life, and he was like, man, you're real. And he just got to sit there and worship his Savior. How cool of a moment must that have been to be able to see someone that you care about deeply go from a life that's apart from Christ to a life that's with him, to go from doubting him entirely, even though he had literally just done years with him, to suddenly being like, man, there he is. You guys remember that, that name that you wrote down earlier? What if you got to see that person have a moment like Thomas's on fall kickoff. There's a person, there's a couple people that I wrote down that if I got to see that happen, there's, there's nothing better. There's, 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 nothing, there's nothing better than getting to see someone that I care about cross that line from doubt to believing. And that's what we have an opportunity to do in two weeks. We have an opportunity to bring someone so that they might have an earth-shattering experience with Christ and come to know that he's good. That's what we have an opportunity to do, you guys. That's our mission. That's our job. To tell people that God is good and then we get to be a part of the life change and we get to celebrate that alongside them. Will you bring someone with you on September 18th and 19th, will you not come to church alone? Will you actually grasp the fact that this matters, that you might actually save a life because that is our job, is the only reason why we exist on this planet, is to help someone else cross the line of faith and follow Jesus. What if you didn't come alone on September 18th and 19th? What if you got to get ringside seats to seeing that person that you love and care for go from once I was blind to now I see. You could be a part of that life change. But maybe you've been sitting here for a while and you've been thinking, you know what, Braden? This whole time you've been talking to Christians, you've been talking to people who already follow Jesus, but I don't know if I've ever had that life change in my own life. And if that's you, guys, we could take a really quick little second and just be like, you know what? I want to I want to be like Thomas. I want to go from, you know what? Once before I was before I was doubting, but now I believe. I believe that you're legit God. We could take a quick little second, pray a quick little prayer and just say, you know what, God? I believe that you're real. I believe that you love me and that you died for me. I believe that you rose again and that you want to give me life in this life. And you guys, God would show up just like Jesus showed up for Thomas, he could show up in your life and give you life in this life. This is John 20. We read this earlier, John 20, 31. It says, these are written so uh, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's what Jesus wants to do for you. That's just what Jesus wants to do for you tonight. 
He wants to give you life and a hope in the future. Can you guys bow your heads and close your eyes for me for a second? I know there's some people in this room tonight who want to make sure that they got what Thomas got, that they get, they have the, the experience where they, they have a change of heart. They go from one thinking one way to thinking another and believing in you, Jesus. And so if that's, if that's a prayer that you know that you need to pray today, if everyone could just repeat after me, that would be super awesome. Everybody say, Dear Jesus, I'm sorry for doing life without you. I don't want to do it anymore. Today I choose to follow you. I believe you love me, that you died for me, and that you have good plans for me. Take me to heaven when I die and bring me life to the full today. In Jesus' name, amen. Give it up, you guys. That was awesome.